Welcome to Love and Lordship. I'm Greg Williams, your host, and I want to thank you for joining us again. I get great responses to last week's teaching, and that was, where's your treasure? Because that's where you'll find your heart. That is a core principle of discipleship. Wherever our heart is, that's where we're going to be walking. That's what's leading us, and we need to understand that. This week, we're going to move into a next step of that in order to make disciples, as Jesus called us to in the, in the Great Commission. We have to be one first. So this week's title is literally, To Make Disciples, You Must Be One. With that said, let me go back to the Great Commission in Matthew 28 and 19. I'm just going to use one part of that. We've talked about it a little bit. We want to expand on it. But Matthew 28 19, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, because of that authority, and this is the, the key phrase for this lesson, Go and make disciples. Now, in our title, I've already said this, but in order to make disciples, we must first be a disciple. Number one, that is a command, and it's interesting, we don't tend to teach this or expect it, but in the culture that the Bible was written in, everyone who was writing this and everyone who was hearing or reading it would have understood that Jesus was giving this not just as the Great Commission, which is what we call it, it is a great command. We are being commanded as his disciples to go and help others know him and follow in his footsteps. Okay, So we need to receive that as such because that's the way it was written and it still carries that weight today. We need to understand the command to us to not only be, but then to go make. The second thing then is you have to remember that it was not train up experts and send them out, although we can do that and that's good. It's literally for each and every one of you to be obedient to this command. It is as you go along the way, as you live your life, you are doing it in such a way that others see and want to walk in the same footsteps. So my life has to be lived in such a way that it reflects and points to Jesus Christ as my Lord. That's what it means for me to be a disciple. If I do that, I do it in such a way to live so that others desire to do that same thing. I can't force them to do it, but as I go along the way in my life, I want others to see Him. That's what it means to be a disciple and begin to make disciples. The third thing is, is a call to a way of life. In other words, this has to impact every part of my life, not just when I show up at church or at youth group or at prayer group or Bible study or small group. This has to permeate every part of my life. It has to be a way of life, not just a conversation. Let me sit, let's sit down and let me share with you the gospel. That's a beautiful thing to do, and we should. But if that gospel is not a way of life for me, that's likely going to be exposed somewhere along the line. And it may do as much damage as it's done good. If I make it a way of life, when I share it, the integrity is there. Remember the wholeness, the shalom. My, my actions speak louder than my words. Both are needed. Actions are more important, but we need both. The integrity of a life lived then lines up with the words shared. Let me repeat that. If I make it a way of life, remember it is a command. I should obey it accordingly. Number two, I have to remember that it is as I go along the way, therefore number three, it has to be a way of life for me. If that is going on in our lives, we are walking as disciples of Christ and the integrity of that walk comes through when we share it. Okay? The, the integrity of the life lived lines up with the words. That's the core of what it means to be a disciple and what it means to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Let me give you something historically that I think you'll find interesting. I, I've, I've been studying this myself and I ask a lot of people, my, uh, my good friend Jeff Hancock and I have talked about this a bit, uh, who helps me with these videos. Uh, I, I, we, we got to talking about the timeline for the apostles and for the apostle Paul. And I found out that the in, in Acts chapter 9, this is, this is all free, by the way. This is extra, okay? In Acts chapter 9, 
early part of Acts chapter 9, Saul has his great blinding conversion on the road to Damascus. Just a few verses later at the end of chapter 9, he is speaking publicly in the synagogue at Jerusalem. So we tend to think of that as, wow, he went to Ananias in Damascus. If you read chapter 9, you'll see this. And Ananias taught him a little bit. He spoke in Damascus a little bit. I imagine he was doing that as much to defend himself as it was excited about what he had just received. In other words, Ananias, when the angel came to him, he said, wait a minute, Lord, you want me to do what to Saul? He's the guy that's been killing us. So I imagine a lot of the other uh, disciples that were followers of Christ in Damascus were going, wait a minute, I'm not sure we want to hear from you. Matter of fact, we want to run from you. So Paul probably right there in Damascus for the first few days or weeks or however long he stayed there while Ananias was teaching him, he was probably proclaiming the gospel, the conversion, his relationship with Christ now, which is what the gospel is. He was explaining that as a way to defend and show people that he was a changed person. But then we move to the end of chapter 9 and he's speaking publicly in the synagogue in Jerusalem. The timeline is about three years. So Paul goes back to Jerusalem after being converted on the road to Damascus and with Ananias' help. He spends three years before he stands up and publicly proclaims that gospel. We tend to go, oh great, you're saved, you're now a disciple, go serve in love. And we need to rethink that. I, I believe that would make a huge difference in not only the way disciples are made, but the impact we have. Let me give you another example of that. And by the way, we've talked about it before, but it was another 8 to 10 years before he went on his first missionary journey. He was set apart by the Holy Spirit in Acts 13, which is just four short chapters, but eight to ten more years. So we need to understand that to understand the concept of discipleship and what it means for Christ to pour into us through His Word and His Spirit and for us to do the same with others. That's the essence of discipleship. Is It's time-consuming, it's patience, it's humility, it's studying, it's learning, it's disciplining. I'll give you another example. It even happened before that. Most people, I did not know, most people didn't, don't know the timeline between when the disciples were called. If you know anything about Jesus' life, he lived for about 33 years. At 12 years old, he was stumping the teachers in the temple. He knew more than they did. At 13, he would have had a bar mitzvah. That means he would have been considered a young adult in the culture. But out of respect for the culture is the only thing I can figure in God's perfect timing. Christ honored that in his life. And he began his public ministry at the age of 30, which is when in that culture you were considered a mature adult. That means many more of the adults would have listened to and received what he was teaching than if he had started, even though he was the Son of God, if he had started at 15 or 17 or 22. He honored the culture and the people by waiting until he was considered a full, mature adult at age 30, and then he dies at age 33 on the cross. So he had three years from the time he called his disciples until he dies on the cross and ultimately sends them out to turn the world right side up or upside down, as one says, one scripture says. So how long do you think it was between the time that he called them to be his disciples until the time he actually sent them out the first time? In, in Matthew 418 in Mark 116 and in Luke chapter 5 we see that the apostles are called and then they have to respond but then over in Matthew 10 and Mark 6 we find that they are sent out they actually come back rejoicing saying wow we heal people and cast out demons and all kinds of things and Jesus says great but don't rejoice in that successful service rejoice in that you know me that your names are written in the book of life. That's another lesson for us. We get all caught up in the service and we should be serving and helping and loving others. But what really matters is do we know him and are we pointing them to him? And that's discipleship. Do you know how long it was between the, his calling the disciples and his sending them out the first time? 
Remember, he only had three years of public ministry. It was actually two years from the time he called the twelve until he sent them out. Two of the three years of his public ministry were spent in teaching and discipling his own disciples. Now, yes, he talked in the synagogues and there were things going on, but he didn't publicly send them out until two years after he called them, and then one year later, he's dead. Now, he rises again. That's the great part. But in the three years of his public ministry, two years were spent in pouring into 12 guys. How are we doing in our churches and in making disciples when it comes to that kind of patience and that kind of teaching and that kind of expectation for obedience and accountability to that obedience? See, these are things that need to be considered when we talk about being a disciple and making disciples. First, be a disciple. What does a disciple look like? There's two verses that really sum up what it means to be a disciple. Paul captured him in Romans 12, 1 and 2, and he says it this way. I'm, there's obviously several different translations. I might cross over a little bit. I learned it in King James, and it said, Therefore, I beseech you. Beseech you means I just beg or implore. So I'm going to use some of those. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to you, in other words, what Christ has done for you, and that's outlined in the first in, in chapters 8 through 11 in Romans. In view of all that God has done for you in Christ Jesus and His mercy, I urge you to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is just your reasonable act of worship or service. And don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by renewing your mind so that you may be able to discern and understand and live out God's good and pleasing and perfect and acceptable will. Now, I, I carried that out a little further because I want to make some key points in this. There's a second text that helps us understand directly from Jesus' life, Paul writing to the Philippians in chapter 2, and he says this, another key point in discipleship, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but to each other's and the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, discipleship, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, 3 through 5. I think if you look at those two texts, we can truly lay a foundation for what it looks like to be a disciple. Following our Lord, that's the Philippians part, and then what, what we are called to do so that it is coming through our lives. Remember, a way of life. Three things stick out in the Romans passage to me, Romans 12, 1 through 2. The first one is, that I, 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 there's four things actually. The first one is, I have to recognize that it's because of God's mercy that I'm even in this position. In view of God's mercy, the, that He doesn't give me what I deserve, and His grace, that He does give me what I don't deserve. That's what salvation, we've talked about it before. I need to recognize what He's done for me in that. And then in view of that, the second one is I have to give my body, my life, my values, my goals, back to God. As a living sacrifice, I often say this when I'm teaching on this, you know the only difference between the sacrifices of the New Testament and the Old Testament? Is the New Testament ones, you and me, we can get up off the altar and run away. But the analogy of the animals that were sacrificed and what we're called to is, is beautiful. I'm supposed to die to myself. So when I crawl up on that altar as a living sacrifice, He doesn't call me to kill myself. He calls me to die to myself, my selfish nature, my selfish desires, my wants, and give those back to Him. The third one then is, what, what does that look like? Well, I don't conform to the way of the world. I don't get caught up in the ways the actions, the thinking of the world, and we ought to probably do that in reverse order, the thinking, the ways, and the actions of the world. I don't conform to that. I instead, fourth thing, 
I transform my life by the way I think, by renewing my mind. What do I renew it with? With his word and his spirit. So let me repeat those quickly so you'll have them. Number one, I have to recognize what God has done for me through his mercy and grace. Number two, I have to choose to give myself as a living sacrifice back to him. That's just a reasonable response to what his mercy has done for me in Christ. Number three, what's it look like? I don't conform to the way the world does things. And number four, instead of just leaving it empty, I transform my mind by renewing it in his word and his spirit. That's what a disciple chooses to do every day. When we do that, we do it because we are following in our Lord's example. Now we're in the Philippians chapter, Philippians text again. And Christ is our Lord and he is our example. So what do we find out in Philippians? How are we to follow as his disciples in his footsteps and be a living sacrifice, what we just talked about? I see five things in there very quickly. Number one, you can't be selfish. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. It means what do I get out of it? I, I got to die to that. Number two, don't, be, don't do anything for vain glory or for vanity's sake. In other words, not only do I have to not go, what do I get out of it? But I, I can't do it going, what do you think of me? That's what vain glory or pride or vain conceit, as, this, as the scripture text said. See, I can not only not do it out of what I get out of it, selfish ambition. I also have to die to, what do you think of me? Did you like that? Is it good? Those two things have to be lost on me. I, I cannot continue to pursue those. And my natural flesh will want to pursue those every single time. They still do. And I've been walking daily with the Lord for 32 and a half years. I've known him for longer than that, but I've been walking daily with him for 32 and a half years, and I'm still learning to die to those two things. How do I not consider what I get out of it, selfish ambition, or what you think of me? I simply have to walk in it for what? Because as I walk in number three, in humility, remember from our previous teachings, humility, and again, we're going to go into all these deeper as we get deeper into the love and lordship message. Humility is being confident and content in who you are, so you can place others above yourself. If I'm wondering what I get out of it, no matter how humble I look or make it sound, if I'm wondering what you think of me, then I'm not really doing it and putting you above me. I'm doing it so you'll give me something back. And if, if, if I'm not truly humble and learning how to be humble, growing in that, that's what will eventually come out. So one, don't be selfish. Two, don't be vain. Don't what others think. Number three, walk in humility. Know who you are so you can put others above yourself. Number four, don't just look after yourself. If you do those first three, you know what's going to be a product of your discipleship and your humility? You're going to be looking for the, for the needs of others, looking to meet the needs of others. You've placed them above yourself. How can I help you? And I don't care what I get in return. I don't care what you think of me. Well, well I care in the sense that I don't want it to be bad necessarily, but I'm not concerned about, I need to tell you the truth. You may not like it. I need to be willing to help you when it costs me something. We have to be okay with both of those. And then the fourth thing is this is the same mindset that comes from our Lord. Have the same attitude that was in Christ Jesus, that of humility, which places others above ourselves and not in selfish ambition or vain conceit. Now, that's what it means to be a disciple. How do I pass it on? Remember, in order to make disciples, I have to be one. We've talked about what it looks like to follow our Lord, His example. He's the model. He's our Lord. Walk in His footsteps. And what that looks like for me in Romans as recognizing His grace, giving ourselves back to Him and dying to self and living for Him, not conforming to the world, and transforming our mind and therefore our lives according to his will. And here's the beautiful thing. The end of that text in Romans 12 says, then you will know what God's good and pleasing and perfect will is. You are, and let me rephrase that, you become living, walking proof of God's will, of Christ in you. Now, as you go along the way, great commission, great command, that's what they begin to see. 
they begin to see Christ in you because you are living, walking proof of God's will, and that is Christ in you. You are a living sacrifice choosing to die to self. You give a humble response, others above self. You pass it on then by helping others understand what that looks like. As I said earlier, it's not, it's not natural for any of us. So they're probably, going, just like I did, and likely you will, before we begin to mature in this, we're going to push back. And even as we're maturing, we're going to push back. So we cannot do this in and of ourselves. We have to have His Spirit in us, and that's exactly what Christ gives us when He made the sacrifice, His mercy and grace toward us, His salvation, and now sanctification places His Spirit in us. Now instead of me walking by my feelings, I walk by faith. My feelings I can experience. So that's an easier choice. But the greater choice is to walk in His truth, and His Spirit will always lead me in that. Am I willing to choose that? That's what a disciple does, and that's what a disciple in making disciples helps others do. Here's another thought as we, as we come to the end of this message. You need to always have at least one person discipling you, pouring into you, more mature, and you need to have at least one person that you're pouring into, that you're discipling. A lot of people will call this have at least one Paul and one Timothy. I've heard others say you also need a someone who is completely lost that you're reaching out to. You can't force them, but you need to let them know what this looks like. And through God's grace, he may be reaching out to them as well, chasing them down like he did you and me, and then we get the opportunity to pour into them as well. And you need a Titus. So you need a, a, a Paul in front of you, a Timothy behind you, you need a Titus at your side to help you with this, and you need a Saul before he was Paul that you are pouring into. When you do that, your life is being lived out in such a way that others can see Jesus Christ. That's exactly what it means to be a disciple and to make disciples. Let me close with this final thought. All of this discipleship, it doesn't begin in the church. It begins in your home. That's God's design from the beginning. The beginning was not a church. The beginning was a marriage and a family. And in those intimate relationships in which the most is to be gained and the most is at stake, discipleship begins in the home, the marriage, the home, and the family. Spouses, are you helping to grow yourself and each other in the Lord? Are you praying together? Are you spending some time in the Word? Are you working through difficulties according to His Word? Parents, are you prioritizing the discipleship of your children? Your Timothys are your Timothinas, okay? Your sons and your daughters. Are you prioritizing their discipleship? You're not just there to discipline, punish, and love them. All of that comes together in Christ's love and discipleship. His Lordship, our discipleship. Are you walking in His footsteps and guiding your children in such a way that they will step into those footsteps as well? They're walking in yours so that ultimately they'll walk in His. Now we're back to the integrity part. Is your life being modeled and lived in such a way when you speak it to them, they get it? You see how important that is? That shalom, that integrity, that integral life of a disciple will be passed on. Because I've said it before, but remember, the legacy you leave is not the one you talk about, it's the one you live. The legacy you leave is the one you live. And the first ones to get that are to be your children. It begins in the home with you as the priority discipler responsible for making disciples of your children. Not the pastor, not the youth minister, not the youth coach or the high school coach. All of those can play an important role. But primarily and priority wise, you are the disciple who's supposed to be making disciples of them. Christ's family starts in ours. Take this one step further. His kingdom is built first in marriage and family. It's even described as that. Christ and his bride, God and his people, man and woman, all of those point to this kingdom. So it begins 
by discipling each other's spouses, discipling our children, and then His church is strengthened. The family of God is strengthened by our families growing in Christ as we make disciples in our home. Modeling and making disciples. It begins one at a time and then grows His church and His kingdom. Love and Lordship exist to point people to Christ as Savior and Lord and make that evident in their life and relationships for His kingdom and glory. We rely on the support of those who have been impacted by this message and those they've shared it with. And we ask you to prayerfully consider giving a one-time, a regular monthly, or regular semi-annual or annual gift to this ministry. I have the opportunity not only to do this in churches and with couples and with men, but I go into prisons, I go into addiction facilities, and I work with other organizations on lordship, discipleship, and relationship. Your gifts would help us continue this ministry and expand it. Thank you for that consideration. Love and Lordship, again, is to help others know Christ and make Him more fully known in their life, family, church, and community. Thank you. Have a great day, and God bless.